All right. Let's get going with this. We already covered the dependency, um, the dependency test. So we're going right over fast through this. This is just a fast overview of the 1040. And I got news for you. It's going to be a fast overview of the 1040 because, like I said, you guys should know this already. So I'm going to fly through this. This is actually of the new 1040 form. And so it is very simple. All right. Why they changed this form to this, honest to God, I have no idea. Um, this was one of those decisions that went from two pages to like, what, seven pages, six mm -hmm. pages, which makes absolutely no idea why you would possibly ever do this. I don't think it actually solved anything. I think it just made things worse. But postcard. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why this did it. And on top of it, it takes up a half a sheet on e on two sheets instead of just two full sheets. So I don't get it. Anyway, um, so the reason behind it, God news for you, I don't know. So anyways, it's more or less the exact same form, just broken down into schedules. The idea behind it was it went from the regular two pages, um, which had everything on two sum summarized pages into a bunch of little pages so you could fill them in as needed. The theory being that you only use those other pages if you needed them. All right, so on the very first page is just like it has been before, it's your personal information. It is the label information which lists all your dependents, your address, your, your um, children, you, your taxpayer information, um, this is the one where you basically want to make sure you get all the information correct. When you're gathering information, this is probably the most important part of the form, short of final, if you have a refund or if you have a, a uh, amount you owe. Um, the reason I say that is because if you mess up on this, it's automatically rejected more or less. Um, don't you know, double check the information, especially if you, even if you have a previous year's return, you know, maybe they did a paper return, who knows? Um, so make sure you have the right information, okay? Because um, last year, maybe we did it and we printed out a paper return form for whatever reason, and the social security number is still wrong. So Go over it with them. I know it only takes us, uh, it, it adds a little bit of time to it, but it's probably more beneficial than not going over it. Okay. The label area is really simple and it's not that hard to do. The signature block is used to be on the end of the second page. Now it's right there on the first page. This is where you sign it, they sign it, and you have your PIN numbers if you need to. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Make sure that they sign it. This is actually digital for us for the electronic ones, but on the new forms, it's uh, right there on the first page. I don't know why I would go there. You normally sign a document on the end of a document, but this one's right at the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Weird. It is a little weird seeing it right there, but it's why they did it. Honest to God, I have no idea. The IRS does things. They probably hired a board to say, oh, let's change it this way. Um, okay. Page two is actually, again, another half page, which makes no sense for a half page, but the income section is just the upper portion. It has a summary. Now, again, everything is done by schedule now. So this is schedule one is all of your income area. And again, this whole thing is just the summary page. This is then your totals from that for your adjusted gross income, which is the income plus the Schedule 1 adjustments. Okay. Then you come into your deductions. Very simple. It's just your deductions. There are not too many deductions anymore because, as you know, we've pretty much done away with itemized deductions unless you're doing a past year. Um, by doubling the standard deduction, pretty much everybody's just going to end up with a standard deduction more or less. Um, that did simplify a lot of things, but if you are a regular business, it's still going to be really complicated. Okay. So, but just make sure you know where it is. Um, taxable income then is just basically those minus your, the income minus your deductions. 
gives you your taxable income, the amount you're going to be taxed on. It then calculates any non-refundable credits you put in there, your Schedule 3 credits, um, anything that will count against that taxable income. Now, this is the non-refundable ones. Um, I'm trying to think right offhand. Your um, school income, your school deductions, things like that, the non-refundable credits you may have. I'm trying to think of what offhand. I can't even think of one. Um, child tax one? credit, the first part. The child tax credit, the first part, correct. So those are the non-refundable credits. Okay. Then you put in your refundable credits. These are the fun ones because these actually come back to you. Okay. Um, again, these are off the Schedule 5. Now, again, each one of these is now a separate page. Okay. They are not, for whatever reason, they used to be basically here. They're now on their own page that we have to pull up. Now, on the form, now this is the best part though, in Profiler, for you, they are still more or less one long form. You know, it's not so bad when you're doing it on the system because Profiler more or less takes you right through the interview. Um, please do not ever try to use form view because you can do this if you want without the interview and use the form view. It's a pain. I'll be honest. It is a pain to do if you try to use the form view because anytime you do that. Add manually. They don't add it automatically for you. Yeah. Yeah. You actually, and if you want to, if you want to try to use the form view, honestly, hopefully you know what you're doing because we've actually had a couple of people who thought they knew what they were doing and they would call in all the time with questions and it's like, well, what are you looking at? And then we discover they were in form view oh, well, I know how to do this. I don't need to have the interview. Did you yeah. do this? And next thing you know, they skipped over because they didn't know any better. So with these credits, with each schedule, please follow the interview the, the interview process, not the form view. Um, and then simply all it is is a subtraction on the second page for the amount of refund or amount due. Now, again, this almost makes us look like a schedule because there's no signature on here, but it's on the first page where the signature is. Okay, so it's a reverse of the older form. That is all there is for the 1040 anymore. Okay, what we have after this are the schedules. Okay, the schedules, each one has its own booklet now, believe it or not. They actually can pull up a booklet for each schedule, um, which makes it, a whole lot longer to read because not only does it have a schedule one, two, three, four, and five, but it also has a instruction book one, two, three, four, and five. Um, so additional income, they broke it down with this. It's not uh, um, too difficult. It's the same as it has been in the in the past. Just it's just been broken down in the schedules. Okay, it, the intent was to make it easier. I don't know if it does or it doesn't. I mean, it's kind of, some people have said, oh yeah, it makes it much easier in some cases. I don't see where it makes it that much easier, but that's just me. Okay. I don't know how you guys feel about it. I mean, do you think this is actually easier than the old way or what? Nope. No. Probably just because I'm not used to it though. Maybe that's it. Maybe I'm just used to the old way, but this just doesn't seem any easier to me and it doesn't seem like it saves any paper to me i think it's a lot more work and yeah that's just it it seems like it's a lot more work because you're always jumping back and forth between right this schedule and the other schedule you know and, yeah, and then finally you're going back to the summary page is what you're doing seems so, that somebody needed a job and so they just <laughs> yeah the irs they needed to employ somebody Okay, we'll hire somebody, and what they do, they decide this is what we're going to make. We're going to make a new tax form. Um, so, what are you going to do this week? Let's make a new tax form. Yeah, um, really. You know, so in all honesty, it hasn't made it any easier. But um, now this is now again, I don't know why they call us the additional income and adjustments um, because more or less your W two income and all ends up here. So. All of your additional income ends up on this page, summarized on here. Um, 
and then your adjustments to your income. Now, this is all Schedule 1. Now, it's broken down pretty simply. It's just like the IRS form originally was, income, adjustments, adjusted gross income. Um, deductions, you know, just straight through. It wasn't too difficult. The only thing is now they're just on a separate page. Um, these are the adjustments to be subtracted from page two, line seven. This por portion is where it's from page two, line six. So it's not too difficult. This summary here goes to page two on the original page on line six. This portion goes to page two, line seven. Okay. Um, the schedule two or schedule three is the non-refundable credits. Okay. These are the ones that will count against the taxable income, but not again, not against a, a, the refundable amount. So it just basically brings your tax down to zero as we know. Okay. Line two, uh, page two, line 12. Everything basically goes on page two. Page one is just your signature and your address. Okay. The refundable credits, this is the one that matters to you. This is the one that will count towards your um, possible refund. Okay. This is schedule five. Schedule three is the non-refundable. Schedule five is the refundable. And that's all there is basically to the 1040 now. Okay. It has nothing complicated. It's only when you start adding in the additional forms. Man, we get calls all the time. I'm going to have to turn that off. I'm getting calls constantly from it. I'm just turning off that. Okay. So that's an entire summary of the 1040. I mean, that's really all you need to know for it. That's all there is to it now. Um, it's very simple. It's, you know, it hasn't changed at all. Really breaking it up into schedules did nothing to the form other than just make it multiple pages. Okay. So nothing there other than what, uh, what it has been for all these years, you know, just broken down into multiple pages in the schedules. Just know that schedule one, two, three, and four, schedule one is the income. Um, schedule three is the non-refundable credits. Schedule five is the refundable credits. Those are the important ones. All right. And that's all we've got on those. So that's the 1040. Now, there are two schedules in there, which we didn't cover. Okay, that's schedule two and schedule four. Schedule two is, come on. Taxes. Your taxes. Summary of your taxes. Okay which is your tax amount. Um, it is not too difficult, but it is where a lot of your calculations occur. If you're going to do something, use something like the alternative minimum tax or uh, anything of that nature. Okay. That is your taxes that you paid. Okay. And schedule four go here. I'm going to pull it up here. Let's see if I can show you Schedule 4 because it is the only one. And it's one we pretty much don't bother with. It's other taxes. And the reason is... Tax. Well, yeah, it does have self-employment tax, but that's mainly the reason. Screen 2. Here we go. And the health care on there, too. Schedule four is the one that we use for, there we go. Can you guys see that now? Schedule four is other taxes. 
This is the one that is for people who are either self-employed or have alternative taxes or things like this. In other words, it's for the people who have more complicated tax returns. Um, now, honest to God, that's a whole bunch of people as far as I know. Uh, you know, I know of a whole bunch of people who have self-employment. So, um, healthcare, this is an important one because we add Schedule 4 on there for the individual healthcare. That's if they have individual responsibility for healthcare. Um, so this is for anybody who is basically self-employed. What's we happening with the health care this year? Uh, this year, we're coming not going to, this upcoming year, yeah. we are not going to be asking them basically the question about if they have health care because we're not going to penalize them for it. So are they going to take this little part out? Well, I'm not sure yet. See, remember, everything is still up in the air until, yeah. until what comes up. Um, this, yeah. yeah. The marketplace, you still have to buy. Yeah, you'll have to, no matter what. If you have, if you're getting it in the marketplace, because you have to report it to them. That's their requirement. Oh, or I can file it. Because what's happening is, is that's how they determine if you're eligible or not. So. Now I have to be on there. So that's where this section mainly comes in, and this is the self-employment tax, and you have to have. Again, you put this whole Schedule 4 because of the Schedule SE. Okay, the Schedule SE is for self-employment, and that's going to be the one place where we have on there that we have a lot of people who have it. Okay. Or early retirement. Early retirement. So there is a lot of, of uh, or the additional tax when you have it on the IRAs, things like that. So... Yes, this form is really not considered, it's considered supposedly for people who don't, it's supposed to be for a very small group of people. I get these people all the time. So learn, we're going to go over the Schedule SE too, by the way. So we're going to go over that a little bit because the Schedule SE is really important for you even though they don't cover it to a large extent, we really need to understand it. And uh, there's a lot of people in Oregon who use the Schedule SE. I mean, I don't know about you, but I even use the Schedule SE. Shell uses the Schedule SE because we have businesses on the side. Yeah, my husband's up to play. There you go. You know, I mean, half the people I know use the Schedule SE somewhere. So, yeah. So yeah, so I think it's probably more important than everybody else views. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna get to it, and that's actually one we're gonna come to in a little bit later because we're gonna cover the self-employment section. All right. So what we're gonna do is this: we're gonna go over where everything is reported to based on if you were making the calculations. So let me do this. Okay, you guys, I got to run to the high school and pick up a kid, and I'll be right back. Okay. Do you, how long are you going to be? Probably 20 minutes. Okay, no problem. No problem. So just carry on. I'll, be, I'll, cat, I'll watch the section. On watch, the, to watch the video. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll be back. Okay. There we go. So what we're going to do is this is a snapshot of where we do the 1040 calculations. What we do is the income is on page two and on schedule one, all of the income and the adjustments. Um, now, again, guys, this should be pretty basic to you guys. Let's be honest. You guys have been doing lots of returns, okay? I shouldn't be explaining anything that you don't understand. This is mainly for a review for you, so we're going to go through this pretty quick. Um, if you were new at this, I'd have to spend time on this, okay? But honestly, I shouldn't have to. So 
Income and adjustments. They go on the 1040 on page two on, and on schedule one. Those are your income and adjustments. Just like you were going down the form. That gives you your adjusted gross income, right? Your income minus your adjustments, adjusted gross income. And you have your deductions. If it's a standard or an itemized. Okay, very simple. That's all on page two of the 1040. Then you have your taxable income. That is the 1040 page two and schedule two. Okay, that will determine your tax liability. All right, your tax liability then is your non-refundable credits, which is page two. Now again, all these are on the second page of, of the 1040. It's very simple. That is the non-refundable ones, which will reduce the liability only to zero. And that's all on schedule three. And then the tax payments that are made during the year. Now these are the additional ones are from schedule five, all again on page two of the tax form, which end up with your refund plus your refundable credits are all subtracted from your tax liability to give you if you are owed a refund or an amount due. And that's all there is to this. Okay, it's very simple. But now we're going to get into what it actually looks like number wise. All right. Joe has an income of $20,000 with no adjustments. His deduction is $12,000. His tax liability is $803. His employer withheld a thousand bucks of his federal income tax from his paychecks during the year. So what is Joe's AGI? So what do we got for the income? $20,000. Okay. So we have a total of $20,000. His adjustment, he has no adjustments, so what's his AGI? 20000 20000 well, He didn't have all these things covered up. So, so what is his taxable income? 8000 8000 because it's the $12,000 in deductions because mm -hmm. he has no other things. So $8,000 in taxable income, okay? And does Joe have a refund or an amount due? And how much? Refund. So, so he paid 800, and, his tax liability is 803, and he withheld 1,000 bucks. So it's 1,000 bucks minus 803, 197 bucks. Yeah. Okay, so yes, $197 for a refund. Okay, Mary has a $30,000 income, $6,000 of adjustments. So, Let's start out with her AGI, which is going to be 30,000 minus 6,000 adjustments, $24,000, right? Her deduction is $18,000. So that gives her a total of taxable income of what? So it's 24,000 minus 18,000. 6,000. 6,000. There you go. 6,000. Her tax liability is 603. Her employer withheld $1,200 from her paychecks. So you got 1,200 minus 603. And we got it. What's that? Cha-ching. Cha-ching. You got it. Cha-ching. Okay, we know it's about 600 bucks. It's 597. 597. There you go. So let's double check here. That is exactly right. All right, Julia has 16000 in income and no adjustments. Deduction of 18000 Her tax liability is zilch. Her employer will th withheld 800 bucks. This is pretty straightforward. More cha-ching. More cha-ching. What is her AGI? 16000 Yep. Okay. Taxable income? 2000 Uh. Oh, no. Below zero. She's at zero. Yeah. Okay. So she has no taxable income. Her deduction is eighteen thousand. She only had sixteen thousand in income. So her taxable income, zilch. She has a refund of eight hundred bucks. Yep. There you go. All right. Frank has fifty thousand dollars in income. No adjustments. That already tells you fifty thousand bucks. 
His deduction, 12000 So 50000 minus 12000 gives you, what, 38000 mm -hmm. Okay. His tax liability is 4373 He made estimated tax payments to the IRS totaling $4,000. So it looks like he owes $373. Mm -hmm. We close. Look at that. 50 yep. 38, 370. Okay. So that's all there is to this. It's very straightforward. Okay. You guys know how to do this. Yep. That's all there is for those. All right. So let's get on to the next area. Now, that was, by the way, for a new person, what I just covered takes literally two sessions. Wow. Yeah, because they have to learn it all, and we have to go into detail on it. Not for you guys, sorry. I am not going to take two sessions to cover that with you guys. Yeah. That makes <laughs> so, so, sorry, you guys are much better than that. All right. This is very, 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 very simple. So I'm going to share these. There we go. Filing basics. This, pretty straightforward. What you need to file, who needs to file, when we need to file. Okay, these are the basics of about all of the filings. So, here we go. So, starting in 2018, U.S. citizens or residents who file U.S. individual income tax returns file using only the Form 1040. Now, why is that important? The other forms don't exist anymore? They don't exist anymore. What were the other forms we had? 1040EZ, 1040C, uh, uh, 1040... I mean, we had an entire group of different 1040 forms. Okay? There is only one 1040 form now. And what's the rumor about the 1040 form that they've created for a simplified one people. yeah the 1040 citizens? yeah senior citizens or yeah. the cs or whatever that form gonna be live. honestly i have no idea or if um it's based on low-income people it's basically a 1040 easy again <laughs> we went from having a no 1040 easy to having a 1040 easy again because I think some people complain that there's no 1040 EZ. Don't ask me. <laughs> so, because um, we had the 1040 EZ, the 1040A, the 1040, okay, it didn't make any sense to, you know, have all these, I guess, at one point. So we did away with them, made a 1040. Now people have complained that there's only one form, and now they want the 1040 EZ and all that back again. So, all right, so the 1040 EZ was for people who had what? Simple return. Simple return, you had to have income of under $25,000. Um, they've got a draft out now for the SR. Ooh. For which? They've got a draft for the 1040 SR out now. Ah. It's only been out for five days. No kidding. Well, different? Yeah, it's supposed to be a much simplified. I don't know how you could simplify it too much further. I mean, honestly. It has the standard deduction chart right on there. Oh, that's kind of cool. I suppose that's. Yeah, I suppose here, just take this, you know, fill this out. Hmm. Okay, so, I mean, the 1040 easy was based on you pretty much had to have just a W-2, a certain amount, and nothing else, pretty much. Then you got a 1040 easy. Um, h and Block used to basically supposedly do them for free. They never actually did them for free, ever. That was just a few people ended up with the 1040 easy for, for nothing. But then you had the 1040 and the 1040A. Honest to God, there was no real difference between the 1040 and the 1040A. Okay, but they were, they were. But you could put earned income credit on it or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
that was pretty much the only difference. But having three forms made people feel happy. So, okay. So, yes, now we only have the 1040. Everyone uses the 1040 to report it. Next year, it looks like we're going to have the senior citizens version and very possibly a 1040 EZ version, which would be kind of the senior citizens version plus who knows. So, wages and forms. So, when we get into this, we're going to start getting on where they, they are reported from. Okay, the W-2, very simple. Where do we get all of our information from? Right at the top, right here at the box two, box one and box two, federal income taxes withheld, wages and tips, okay? Those are the two probably most important boxes we come across. They're really simple. Um, these are for the W-2s. Normally, in a W-2, the only boxes that actually really have much in them other than the name and and the EIN number of the company. Um, the only exception to that is Oregon. By the way, we do have to pay attention if they have what filled out. What's the most important for our people in Oregon? I don't know where you're going with it. Remember, if they work in Oregon or versus... No, right down here. Remember, a lot of people we have work in Washington and live in Oregon. So what we have to look for is those people who still owe Oregon tax or owe Oregon tax, but it's not on their W-2. Okay. Yeah, I'm out here. We don't have to worry much about that. Okay. No, that's true. That's true. But that's one of the things we do need to be concerned about is the non-resident income, the people who are... Um, living in Oregon, but working in Washington. Okay. Cause we do have a lot of that that goes on in Portland because they still owe Oregon tax. Yep. Okay. So it may not have something down here, but because up here are the federal ones, but down here are the Oregon ones. Now I realize down South, you're going to have everything more or less already reported because everybody down there is paying the Oregon tax. But like I said, up here, we have a whole lot of people who work in Washington, um, but still owe some Oregon tax. Okay. All right. What we need to do is realize where they go on the forms. This is straightforward. This wages, these are the wages here. Wages are transferred to this field here, straight through on the form. Wages and tips. If you have multiple ones, what do you do? Straight up. Multiple ones with what? W2s? Multiple, w, multiple W2s. Add them together? Add them together. I'm thinking about basically if you have a paper return, you know, oh, I mean. Okay. I'm just saying, you know, because there are some people who don't understand. I'm going over the basic, basically, because it's going to be something to understand that if you have multiple W-2s, it's not just a matter of um, putting in, with the computer system, you're just going to put in the W-2s multiple times. It's going to do all the math for you. But when you're taking this test, you have to realize that it's not going to be working the same way. You're going to have to understand that you sometimes do have to add them all up. Okay. It's going to be more like taking a paper test. So this amount that you have, if you have three of these with this amount, you're going to be putting in the sum of three of these in this line. Okay. Because like I said, with profiler, you're not being, you're not concerned about that because profiler is going to do the math for you. Okay. So, wages and tips, all the W-2s, summarize this field, wages and tips, into this field. Okay? So, next one. Tax withheld. Federal tax withheld, straight up. This is basically your, now, your schedule, um, two information for taxes. 
tax withheld. Federal income tax withheld, line 16. Again, summarize it based upon if you have multiple W-2s. Um, hang on one second. There we go. So let's look at this. So she received two W-2s, $275 of unemployment compensation, this Karana, $58 in total adjustments to income. So let's go ahead and answer the following questions. Okay, so she has two W-2s, so we can always, well, let's, we'll refer back to this when we need to. So she worked at two different jobs during the year and received two W-2s. Um, she was not employed for part of the year and received $275 of unemployment compensation as reported on line 19 of the, w, of the 1040 and has no other income. Has adjustments to the income that total $58 on line 36. Okay, now, now let's see. Adjustments, are we talking about a subtraction or an addition? Um, it would be a subtraction, basically. Okay. okay. So let's go ahead and just look at it. So first question, what amount is entered on line 40, on 1040 line one? So we need to, we can go back here. Here's the tips. Here is the tips. And we have that amount there of unemployment. Okay. $58,645.70. Okay. Now, question. How much did you say? Not, oh, I added the unemployment. Okay. 58371. 58371. That's correct because it would not include um, the unemployment for this one. Okay, now, what is the total income on line six? So again, that's the what the was thing. the unemployment? Unemployment was uh, uh, two seventy five. So total income was the bottom one. Yeah, you went for total income. So, so you had how much? The bottom one. So you had the 58, six and, okay. Yeah. So and that's yeah. what it is. If the total income she had is that, the total wages is the other two, so, okay. So now how much is the adjusted gross income? I don't remember what so let's go back here. It's five, eight, six, four, six is the total. $58,588. And so we had how much in adjustments? $58 in adjustments. Yeah. So how much are you guys getting? Number two there. Number two? That's that. That is perfect. Way to go, dear. So it is 58588 All right. Well, and Carissa Taylor are married. Their filing sta status is married filing jointly. Their W-2s are form are shown. Whew. Using this information, answer the questions. Okay, now let's take a look here. We got two W-2s. All right, so what do we got on it here? We got 40, what's that amount? I can't even read it. $40,215.52 and $51,241. And $51, so let's take a look here and see what we got. So what amount is entered on the Taylor's line 1040 line 16? So what do we got for line 16? Let's go ahead and assume that we got a 1040 up here. So let me pull that up actually. So I'm going to do this. I'm actually going to make it easier on you 
here. And I am going to do this. I gotta go get my kids in a bit, but I'll take you. Okay. What time do you have to uh, get them? 3.30. What time is it now? It's 3.10? Okay. I usually walk. I'll just take you guys with me. Hop on my phone. You'll take us with you? That almost sounds neat. All right. So what we're going to do is I am going to share this with you. And this is the 1040 form. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump back and forth between this form and this question. So here's the 1040 form. And it is saying the federal income tax for line 16 withheld from all W-2s and 1099s. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So now let's jump back to the question. And what I can do is, where are we here? There we go. Slideshow. Now we can do this from current slide. There we go. All right. So to share screen one. There we go. So we can jump back and forth now. So the total amount withheld is line 16. So how much do we have withheld here? I need my glasses too. I'm blind pretty much without them. That's pretty small. I was going to say here. So we have $2,687.33 withheld from the first one. And we have 4300 and forty-one dollars and fifteen cents withheld from the other. So what do we got here? Seven thousand twenty-eight. Seven thousand twenty-eight. Maybe. Twelve. Yep. I got seven thousand twenty-eight. So let's take a look. Well, I see 7,028 is a possible answer. Yep. So, okay. yes, it is. Is that your final answer? Yes. Oh. All right, way to be. So, that is definitely their total with uh, active amount. Their to I mean, their total uh, amount of tax withheld was $7,028. So, if a taxpayer has paid more income taxes than he owes, he's entitled to a refund. He can do the following with his refund. Apply all or part of it to his next year's tax liability. Okay, which is cool. He can always, you know, set it aside for next year. It's a nice thought. Anybody ever actually done that? The only person I know of that's done that is my brother, actually. And he's yeah. retired, and so he just adds it yeah. into his estimated taxes. Yeah, and I, I don't know too many people actually do that. I don't either. I never um, do that. Yeah, it's, it's very rare that somebody actually goes, you know what, I'm doing a refund. I'm going to use that to my liability towards next year. Yeah, no. Nope. You know, I, actually, you know, it would be really fun if you knew you really always had a refund and starts building up and building up and building up. Next thing you know, you know you've got like a $75,000 refund. I can see that from the IRS. <laughs> you know, so you can apply it to next year's tax liability or receive a paper check from the IRS or direct deposit into a, uh, into a bank account. Direct okay. Deposit. So those are the only things you can do from the IRS. Now we do have our options too, which we have our, we can give our cards. We can do things like that, but yes, mm -hmm. that from the IRS is you can either get it back in a check, direct deposit into a bank account, or apply part of it to next year's tax liability. So those are the important things to know because those are actually the possible tax answers. Okay, there for the test. Okay, direct deposit. 
the accounts listed for direct deposit must be owned by the taxpayer or their spouse if married filing jointly. Okay, that's very important. You can't deposit into Bob's account. Okay. And the taxpayer must provide his routing number and checking account number. Okay. We know this. We've had lots of people who screw it up. I'll be honest. You wouldn't believe how many people screw up that number. For whatever reason, it seems to be the number they can't read off their own check. Okay. So when you're doing that, make sure you verify that number so many times. Okay. So I like it when they call back later and they're like, Oh yeah, uh, oh, I was wrong. I, I was wrong. Like, did I give you that bad. number? Did I give you that? Oh yeah, I did. Oh, guess <laughs> what? We've already filed it. Have a nice day. Whoops. So, you know, it's like you gave us the wrong number or they realize that, Oh my God, that's the account I closed last year. Yep. And it's like, or they have their debit card. What do you mean? You can't take it off my debit card. Right. That's my checking account. Uh, that's not the way it works. And it's like, no, that's your debit card. That's not your checking account. Okay. So, it's like, really, people? I so, use this form that we have at work and make them fill it out. Yeah, make them fill it out with the banking information. And it's we have a important. form, too, and James told me he didn't like using forms. He wants them to write it out themselves. Oh. Well, they do write it on their form. They yeah. do write it on the form, so we'll see. We'll figure that one out. So. Because yeah, then, so it's very important to basically have, and it should then be scanned into the do, into the tax return, so we can say, "Hey, here's the form they gave us for the routing number." Right. So, but it's very simple. On the bottom of a check for a checking account, the routing numbers are generally at the bottom of a check. If a check, if a taxpayer requests a direct deposit, and the IRS cannot complete the deposit, the taxpayer is sent a paper check. That sucks. Do you know why that sucks? Any idea? That will literally take no. a month, if not longer. longer. Because when it takes, when they can't yeah, they have to get it, it back and then... Yep. And who gets screamed at? Is the IRS? Yeah. Is it the person who screwed up the fact that they didn't give you the, route, the right routing number and account number? no it is them it is you who gets screamed at and everything else so even though they screwed it up you're the one who gets blamed for it so just remember that so if they screw up the routing number and account number it is you who gets in trouble for it now there's an important thing on the end of it this is not the uh, part of the account number you would not believe how many people i have who stick this on the end of the account number the check number. The check oh. number is not part of the account come number. Okay. Yeah, come in. Um, they stick it on there, thinking, "Oh, that's part of it." No, that's not. No. This is not the. This is the check number. If this number matches this number. You know that that's the check number. Do not include it in the account number. Okay. No. So. Pippa. It's very important. No, Pippa. Okay. Other options for direct deposit. Come on. Now, there are ways to direct deposit into other accounts, but they have to be directed into accounts that are specific for you. So in other words, this works just like your bank account, but they are specifically for you. Um, they can go into an IRA, um, like a traditional Roth, um, the health savings account, the edu educational savings account, or the treasury direct online account. Okay, but to use that, like it says, they have to check with their financial institution to make sure it accepts direct deposits. Now, what's going to happen is for the direct deposit, they're going to basically have an account routing number and an account number as well. Yeah. Okay. Pam, everything go okay with you picking them up? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Even got gas. <laughs> All right. So that's very important. You have to get, make sure more than anything. And I like the idea of the form. I really do. And I'd really like to continue it um, so that it gets scanned into the document so that you are not to blame when they screw up the form. Okay. I'm in the form. Yeah. I, I agree. In 
in reality, I want a check. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to get a picture of a blank check. Yes. Yeah. Because I, then you can verify the actual routing and account number because you would be amazed how many times they screw it up. So, yeah. if any of the following apply, the IRS will reject the taxpayer's direct deposit request and send a paper check instead. What? Okay. If any direct deposit information is listed on the uh, 1040, is crossed out or whited out on a paper return. So, if you submit a paper return to them and it's got anything <laughs> on it that makes it questionable, they are going to basically deny it. They're going to send you a check instead. Then you have to wait weeks for it to come in the mail. Yep. And they hate that because they're calling you looking for their check. Right. Okay. If the taxpayer is filing a joint return with their spouse and the financial institution does not allow a joint refund to be deposited into an individual account. So in other words, let's say it's me and my wife and the account I'm, we're depositing in is only in my name, there are certain banks which will not allow a check that's in both of our name because it'll say Ryan and Rochelle Cook. Well, there are certain institutions which say you cannot deposit them both because it's an and. And the account is in just my name. Well, that's a problem. If the taxpayer files their 2018 return after December 21st, 2019, you cannot do a direct deposit after that following year. They will not do a direct deposit. They require a, a uh, um, paper check to be sent. Okay, I know that sucks, but it is true. This is really funny. Three direct deposits of tax refunds have already been made to the taxpayer's account. I don't understand why that's an issue. No. Um, but honest to God, if three direct deposits of tax refunds have already been made to the taxpayer's account, they will deny it and make it a paper check. I do not understand why that's an issue. That means you've had this account for at least three years. You have the account. You have this established account. But if it's the same account... Same account number, same routing number, it will reject it and it will be a paper check. I do not I think understand. that's in one year. I think that's what it means in one year. Yeah, I think not so too. Maybe years. that does, but because that like is I the said, law. Yeah, so consecutive years shouldn't matter. I've had my account I guess, six yeah. months old and always do it into that account. Because you could have um a California and Oregon and Nevada and a federal and they might not want to deposit uh, you know well they don't want scammers using yeah you know other people's right. information and putting it all into one account so they're trying to combat that there's right. actually stuff about that that's on true the irs Maybe. website okay we'll have to double check that because yeah i think that's what they're referring to because i'm just like that doesn't make any sense initially because i've had uh, my checking account for over 30 years and never had an issue with it me either no bad for so but here's the big one. It's just simply the name on the account does not match the tax return. Okay? You can't put it into somebody else's account. You wouldn't believe how many people have tried that. I know. They want to. I I've do had not dependents understand. put it in their parents' accounts. Yeah. I mean, I, I do not understand that. They stick it in somebody else's tax, into somebody else's account. It will not go in. Okay? They, it will, they will reject it if the account's in somebody else's name. And it will reject it. But these are the rules you should know as, as a guideline. Okay? So, now, the payment option. If a taxpayer has paid less income than tax, they owe money. Right? They must pay this additional tax by the due date of their return to avoid the penalties and interest. That's pretty simple. Right? That's pretty much you know, common sense. How do you pay it? Okay. How do most people pay it? Um, check. They write a check. They pay with a credit card. They go online and use the electronic payment. Right. They send a, a check in the mail. Um, or they have uh, the installment loans. It's the installment payment. Okay. So they can pay online. They can pay by phone. 
They can pay, pay by mailing a payment to the IRS. They can pay by check, money order, credit card. And now, like it says, in very rare cases, they can pay in cash. How do you pay in cash? You have to go down there, maybe? You have to go in down person. there. In person. You have to go down in person to the IRS office. And we're talking, if you owe Oregon state taxes, you actually have to go to the Oregon state office. And here's how they screw it up. Um, sometimes they go to the Oregon state office when they owe federal tax. Yeah. <laughs> Or they go to the federal office when they owe Oregon state tax. I had a client do that and blamed it on us. <sighs> yes, that one's always fun. So and I didn't explain they, it well enough, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know how you could not have explained it well enough. I mean, honestly, <laughs> God, they're just sometimes. And there is a way to pay by direct debit. Now, the direct debit is... It's an electronic payment. We'll cover that in some detail, but you know, it's you can pay with your debit card. So now, taxpayers should avoid filing a return because they cannot pay their tax due. How many people do you know put their taxes off until literally April 11th or April 12th or April 13th because they know they owe taxes? Do you right. really like everybody that owes? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Now, honest to God, do you really think this hurts? I mean, do, you, do you think this helps? Do this, do, no. Are they avoid paying the taxes? I like to do it months before so I know how much I owe right. and don't have to pay the interest. Well, they're going to steal all the, the, pentra, the interest and penalties. You know, I mean, it's like if they make a late payment, and here's what happens. Okay, what happens when they file April 13th or April 14th because they think that they're going to owe money? And it goes into the Fed electronically. Now, what happens at the Fed? The Fed reviews it and says, oh, no, we have a problem here. And guess what happens? It gets rejected. What just happened to your tax return? You're now late. Because <laughs> it's got to be fixed. Mm -hmm. So you didn't file on time. Cool thought, huh? Yeah. All because you were stupid and waited until the last minute. Okay? It is not worth waiting until the last minute to file your taxes just as you think you owe. Okay? It doesn't make any sense. Okay? Or avoid it. Or you get that person who comes in and goes, um, I got to file my taxes. Okay? Yeah, I haven't filed them for a little while. Okay? And how many years are we talking about, sir? Um, I haven't filed them since uh, 2002. What? <laughs> you know, so you've got to do your taxes from 2002 on. Mm -hmm. Well, I owed some money. Well, you owe your house now, okay? <laughs> you know, it's like, so it's like, did you avoid anything? <laughs> you know it's like do you know what your penalties are now do you know what the interest is now um so i haven't filed my taxes for several years you know kind of thing you are not helping yourself okay so uh, i haven't filed my tax for several years does not help um don't avoid it and if they cannot pay the full amount due by the due date on the return they send in an installment agreement. It's very simple. Okay. So payment by check, we just put up the 1040 V. Really simple. It's a check voucher. They send it in with their with their um, return. They enclose the payment with it. It's really simple. Okay. Very simple. Um, note this, which is whichever is really interesting. If the check bounces, it's really it's 25 bucks or 2% of the check amount, whichever is more. Not whichever is less, it is whichever is more. Okay? So if it's a big enough check, that could be a lot of money. So, all right, credit card payment. It's easy, okay? They can pay with a credit card or debit card right over the phone, okay? They can do it. They can put a, they have, they can even do it over time. Okay. 
Um, it's made through an IRS authorized provider. It's electronic funds transfer. I can't even remember what it is. E F T something or other, but it's a payment service. You get on, make the payment through them. It's very simple. Um, the cards taken, it'll take like MasterCard, Visa, you know, pretty much any card. American Express, I think they actually take two for a change. So it's not hard. They charge a convenience fee for doing it. That's it. Okay. Um, how much they charge? Each one charges a little bit different fee, but that's you can pay it all that way. Direct debit. They they can do so, a direct debit. It's you can make a payment online through the IRS website, or you can call the IRS to authorize the debit. And they just basically take it take it right out of your account. It's not that hard. This is the one, this is the electronic federal payment tax payment system. Okay. This is a tax free payment service provided by the U S department of the treasury. Um, you just select, you just register, make it, make your payment. You have to provide your pen. Okay. Part of the credentials. You get a personal identification number. It comes to you by mail. Okay. It's not that hard. It's when you first sign up, they, you ask, they ask you for your information. Then they send you a PIN number by mail, just kind of like the bank does initially. You get it, and then you can actually make your payments through them online. Okay? It's not hard. Um, and it's actually through the, the, uh, 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 through the IRS, basically. It's their own. It's through the Treasury Department. Okay? Not hard. All right. Now, if the taxpayer cannot pay the full amount due on their return, guess what? They're going to jail. No, probably not. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it's like, no, they actually just end up with an installment agreement. I can't pay. Well, the IRS is not going to, you know, realizes that, you know, you're probably not Al Capone. Okay. He did not, you know, he did not pay his taxes. So he went to jail for it. Well, he intentionally did not pay his taxes. Most people, however, did not realize they're going to owe money, and as a result, they end up having to pay something, and what ends up happening is they end up with an installment agreement. It's something that all of a sudden, oh, I owe $500 in taxes. Oh, wait a minute. I don't have 500 bucks. What am I going to do now? Well, you make it in payments. So... They apply for an installment agreement. It's very simple. It's the 9465 installment agreement request. And it goes either with the tax return or separately. And it makes just a, uh, a uh, set of payments established. Okay. It's very, very simple. Now you do have to pay the penalty and interest, but they're stuck in there with it. Okay. They may actually have to pay a fee. Okay. They must pay a fee to start it. It's only if it's granted. Now the fee is two hundred and twenty-five bucks, so it is yeah. not cheap. Okay. If they do, however, do it by electronic funds withdrawal, and this is probably the best part, it's reduced to one hundred and seven dollars. That's still much of a not much of a help. Okay, but that just means that it's going to be pulled out regularly by electronic funds. So just know that. The installment agreement costs two hundred twenty-five dollars. If they do make it by electronic funds withdrawal, which means they're setting up regular withdrawal, it drops to one hundred and seven dollars. Okay. If they do set up um, via the online payment agreement, the uh, fee. So if they're actually doing the online payment agreement, the fee is one hundred and forty-nine dollars. Okay. So you can set it up online too. All right. So there are two versions. One is to set it up through the website. One is to set it up um, right through the regular form. Okay. These first two are for the form. The second two are if you go through the online system. Okay. Now, there's an important thing. You know how this looks very expensive for the 225, mm -hmm. 107. It's pretty, you do actually, that's a pretty good chunk. Taxpayers with low income is below a certain level because we already know that they are not able to pay a lot of things. 
well, hitting them with a whole lot more of fees in addition to it are not going to help. So if you are considered a low income person, they do drop the fees. Um, you can qualify for a reduced fee of $43. Okay. And if you do it electronically with a reduced fee, it goes to $31. So it's not so bad then. Okay. Now, do not include the fees with their uh, 95, uh, 9465 when they make their request. They do not do this. This is just um, a fee if they are approved. So don't start sending cash in with it. Okay. The IRS will send a notice of approval with the details about if it's approved or not. Okay. So yep. let's go through a couple of these things. Taxpayers who cannot pay their full balance. Okay. What are they going to do? They are going to go to prison, right? Mm -hmm. They are going to apply for bankruptcy. Nope. Well, they could. But what do you no. mean they're not going to apply for bank? I'd apply for bankruptcy. I can't oh, bankruptcy. yeah. You, but, but the IRS doesn't count in bankruptcy. The IRS doesn't count bankruptcy. So, man, that, was, uh, that one sucks. Okay. Fire the fire. <laughs> fire. File their return and submit an IOU. I like that one. I do too. <laughs> How do you submit an IOU to the IRS? Nah. Very carefully. So that one's a probably not. Yeah. Um, not file their return until un, uh, until able to pay. I like that one. That one's a probably a positive one. Don't you think? No. I don't want to file my return. Why? Because I can't pay. When I get when I get a check, I'll then file. Mm -hmm. So. The last one, request an installment yeah. agreement from the IRS. Okay, that one sounds good. Okay. So, true or false, Margaret is due a refund of $1,877 this year. Oh, I like that. She can have the refund split by filing form 8888, allocation of refund, and have a portion of her refund directly deposited into a pre-established individual retirement account, an IRA, a health savings account, or an educational savings account. True or false? True. We know we covered, we said we can deposit into those things. So mm -hmm. we know that we can stick it in there. So, yeah, she should be able to. So, yes, definitely. True. There you go. Okay, Sib can use the form 8888888. You know, I can't ever say that. 8888. Sounds like 88 Fingers Louie. So, allocation of refund to direct deposit his refund to have a maximum of how many accounts? Now, there's an important number there. Okay, it says you can only do Three. it into how many accounts? Three. Oh, listen to her, man. She just got this answer, you know, like. Okay. So we're thinking well, three. Well, we just talked about this. We did. We did. Yes. <laughs> so it is three. So very good. It is three. Now, signatures. This is really important. Signatures on the return. What is our problem with most signatures for us? When we're getting signatures, because we use an electronic signature system mm -hmm. and whatnot, and because, you know, I mean, we have to make sure everybody's who they say they are and everybody's signing it, what do we usually have as a problem? They don't look like they're real signatures? <laughs> no, most of the time it's the husband or wife that's in there and the other one's gone. You know, the husband's in there oh, having the tax refund done. Typically have that problem. Uh, we have that all the time that the wife's yeah. in there doing the tax refund and tax return and we're sitting there going great so we got to go have yeah. somebody's signature um or we Put have the signature package on hold and wait for the other person to come back yeah see that's the problem we end up with all these on hold for months or sometimes when it's like oh my god somebody come on or calling them to remind them so yes getting that signature is often the hardest thing so they must sign and date their return if they're filing a joint return, and that's what I was saying. Now, how do you get around that, by the way? Paper tax return. Mm, there you go. That's one way. That's one way, yeah. Paper tax return. Power of attorney. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. Power of attorney. 
What about that remote signing thing? Has anybody That's what we're going to be doing here. Now, last year, it was only available to certain situations, so they didn't actually even make it available. Yeah, like they couldn't there, be a new client and stuff like that, Yeah, right? it had certain restrictions on it, which pretty made it worthless. Um, but remote signing this year will probably be a whole lot different. We're trying to um, make it where, you know, we can use it in lots of places. Remote signing will allow you to sign um, to sign where you can go and uh, get a document. It's an electronic signature through your email. So it'll be great. And we will. All I have is the cat. So now, if they are married and filing separate returns, the taxpayer and spouse must sign must sign only his or her returns. That's that's uh, simpler that way and in addition to their signature that you have to enter the occupation of the taxpayer and the spouse okay it's very important because we you would believe how many we've had where it doesn't have it entered why is that so important to enter their occupation because the irs needs it for census information that's right. Okay, so what happens is, is most people don't. Um, Hi. Uh, mommy. I was going to text. Yeah. The IRS uh, uses tax returns as general census information and information collection in the off seasons when we're not having a uh, census. So that's what they that's what they use it for. So they really need to have it on there. So a lot of times they ask that exact same question. What do you need to know? That's why. So statistics. Statistics. The IRS said so. Demographics, because yeah. <laughs> the IRS said so. You want to check? You're going to tell me. You know. So hey. So now, for you as a tax preparer, you must sign the return. So all preparers must have a P10 and enter it on the return. Okay. Now, in our case, it doesn't matter. I won't even let you in the system without a P10. So, okay. If the taxpayer is filing their return electronically, they and the taxpayer will find form 8879 instead of the form 1090, which it's fine because we sign ours basically electronically. So ours goes on the form and it's not a big deal. All right. Because we actually have an electronic signature that goes into the system through the, through the signature pad. Okay. All right. Now, the bottom of now this is for question here. The bottom of Ezekiel's and Valencia Archer's form 1041 is not complete. Their filing status is married filing jointly, and their par, their par, paid preparer is Charles Franklin. Okay, fill in where each person should sign their information. So, where are we going to fill in what? Okay. Well, Archer goes on your signature line. Mm -hmm. So this is here. The spouse is Valencia's. Here. Yeah, okay. right there. Occupation, phone number, and here is Archer. His printed name, his signature, and then the important thing. P10 over here. Yep. D10 over there. Okay, so let's see here. There we go. There we go. Okay, so these are the reform changes. Now, this is what's really important. This is where it changed a whole lot. And this is the important change from 2017 to 2018. Okay. It went from the 6,350 to 12,000. It went from the 12,000 to 24,000 and from the 9,000 to 18,000. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those are some major changes. Now, the other thing is the tax liability rates. Okay. The 10% for the lowest one stayed the same. But the 15% category went down to 12. The 25% went down to 22. The 28 went down to 24. 
the 33 went down to 32. The 35 stayed the same, but the 39.6 went down to 37. So most of the middle class rates all dropped. Okay, so that's something to note. Most of the middle class rates dropped for the overall tax liability rates. Those are important numbers to know. All right. Now, this year, I think it's 12-4 is what it's going to be, I think. I, I can't remember. I got to look. But I think it's 12-4. I think it's 24-8. And then I'll see what the HOA, the, the head of household is. So, but we'll all look these up for the upcoming year. But these are important ones to know. Okay. So if you're going to take a snapshot of any screen, this is what I would suggest. All right. All right. On to the next. All right. Well, actually, it's four o'clock. Let me do this. We're going to take a Let's take a 15 minute break really quick because I got to make a phone call. They've been calling constantly. All right. So let's take a 15 minute break and then we'll get right back to it. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. We'll be back in 15 minutes. All right. I made it home with the kids with a little to no yelling and crying. <laughs> success. That is successful. Six, eight, and ten, so. <laughs> wow. That's how my daughters are. They're, um, well, they're not that way anymore, but they were like, you know, two years, they are two years apart. And then she had, let's see, 10, four years, and then two more, two years apart. Uh, all right. Ooh. I'm done. long walk for me. <laughs> Comfort food time. I had to mute it several times and so I could yell at my dog. <laughs> well, at least you know it works while you're walking. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty, uh, pretty seamless there. Good coverage out here. All right, there we are. And she will be back in one second. So we will get going here. New share. That one right there. Okay, you guys see that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right, and I have a dog sitting next to me begging for cheese. <laughs> That's yours. They're doing a bite. I know. <laughs> <laughs> 
No good. While she's gone for that second, I'm going to be gone for one more second quick. Okay. I'm just going to close my garage door. It's getting cold in here. I'll take you guys with me to the bank too. Everybody left us, Pam? I guess. I'm okay. here. I just I just gotta I just gotta take you guys with me to the bank. That's all. <laughs> okay. We're traveling? Yes. Okay. No, don't let squash out. Don't I I'm so afraid he's never gonna come back again. Here's my oh. okay. Come the back up. I gotta go to the Oh goodness. I'm bored. <laughs> Let's play a game. A game? What are you doing now? Oh, I'm going Outside. to the, I'm going to the bank. Um, oh. remember the reason I told you I was having a hard time the other day? <laughs> oh, I didn't tell you the reason. Um, so I got like late on my my uh, health care payments, yeah. and the Affordable Care Act had said that you don't need, uh, or you have three months to pay or whatever, and we were behind um, for all sorts of fun reasons, like car breaking down and crap like that. Um, and so anyway, long story short, I basically cried on the phone to the lady, not on purpose, but I guess it worked because she said they'd reinstate our policy if we paid everything up front, which by then we had the money because Matt had started a new job um, or had a new landscaping account or whatever. And so we were able to do that. Um, well, she said that they would use part of the payment that was that I had already paid for July's payment. And then I would just pay the next couple. Um, and I was like, okay, well, I just got a check in the mail for that payment that they said that they were going to, um, as part of this deal to get caught up. And so now I have to run to the bank and put it in the bank and then run back home and pay it. Okay, I was going to say, it looks an awful lot more like going to the mailbox just got a whole lot farther. Yeah, this is a not-so-fun situation here, but, okay. you know, hey, life right. happens, and yes, it uh, does. we are poor at the moment, so, you that know. Works. All right, this is really simple. This is basically all employee compensation, and as you know, employee compensation is pretty much W-2 to start. Very simple, Okay. Um, there is the first thing to focus on is pre-tax versus post-tax dollars. Okay. It, it's basically a simple thing of when do they pull it out of your payroll for a payroll deduction? It is the taxes are withheld, um, by the employer, uh, for the pre-tax is if it's made before the, uh, um, if the deduction is made before the tax are withheld, it's pre-tax. If it is um, post-tax, it's held, withheld after the taxes are withheld. Now, the one thing to consider is, does it help you or not? Okay. If it is pre-tax, 
remember, you are still going to pay, pay it later on. If it's post-tax, then what happens is, is down the road, what will end up happening is you will end up not having to pay the taxes down the road necessarily. Okay. So let's say you had a thousand dollars in pay. If they withhold a hundred dollars for your 401k, that is the pre-tax deduction. Then you are taxed on the $900. So they would hold out without withhold um, basically $125 and you would get a take home pay of $775. That's how it would work with the pre-tax dollars. All right. Now that's how you consider it as it helps now um, because you are gaining an additional amount on your ta on your paycheck because you are not having to pay any taxes on the amount that was withheld. However, you pay taxes later when you withdraw your 401k. Okay. The other side is, of this is if it was, say, $1,000, same thing. They withhold your total taxes on the $1,000. So instead of it being $125, they withhold $150. Okay. So your payroll amount is $850. Then there, let's say there is a Roth IRA deduction. Now this is a post tax deduction. So this goes into your Roth IRA after your taxes. So your take home pay is now $750. Okay. Versus back over here where it was $775. It is $750, but you, um, it helps later because you will not pay tax when you withdraw the Roth IRA. That's the difference between pre-tax versus post-tax. Okay. The pre-tax deduction, you get the benefit of having more income today, but you end up paying the tax when it's with when it's paid to you um, when you actually start withdrawing it. Post-tax, you don't have you 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 um, have it withheld currently, so you end up with less take home today, but later on you do not have to pay the tax on your Roth IRA. Okay. So, um, if there is, let me see here. Um, if there is say a, a uh, sick pay premium deduction, so you pay taxes on your income, but it, you will not pay tax if and when you pay your sick pay income. So this is a post-tax deduction, so it's pay, sick pay premium deduction, and it is only um, part of your sick pay. So it is actually a post-tax for sick pay. Remember, you only get part of your sick pay, so it is a post-tax deduction. So anyways, we will cover that in a little bit more detail later on, but let's get into the W-2. This is the most important part. The W-2. The W-2 reports all in all in earned income an employer received from their employer paid in the form of wages and compensation during the year. Now, what exactly does that mean? That means all form of income that, that came to you from your employer comes on a single sheet that was supposed to be a summary for the year. Now, it comes on a W-2. What is that different than? What is that different? Thank you. She got it right away. 1099 that does not report because your employer does not pull all of the withholdings. The W-2 has all the withholdings. 1099 is pretty much you are just contract work with them. With the W-2, you are an employee of that company. Okay, and that's the primary difference. So if a taxpayer works for more than one employer during the year, you could have, we've had people walk in with a stack of W-2s, honest to God. Yeah. We've had people who've walked in with shoe boxes of W-2s. Yeah. Um, so 13 is the most I've ever done yeah, at one time. Actually, I, I had one, it was a kid who actually had um, 15 is the most I've ever had. And 15 jobs was enough. Okay, I yeah. was like. I think Mike did one that was 20 something. And I was like, how, how is I, that possible? I, how would, I don't even know how that's possible, but. It was, I think the most, most I've had is 15 W-2s. Now it's W-2s. Now I have yeah. had more than have had that with 1099s, but 
You know, I mean, with a W-2, yeah. that means you actually worked for 15 employers. Right. That's getting that a little... tax return with 46 different forms on there. Most of them were K-1s. There you go. Yeah, that, that happens. That, that makes sense. But honest to God, how you've worked for 15 different employers, I mean, that's more right. than one a month. Yeah. Huh. I mean, really, what were you doing? You know, I mean, come on. So if you have, if that, you have that many W-2s, go back to school. So anyways, now the important thing is they have to come out, or should I say, they are supposed to come out by January 31st. Okay. Yeah. Honest to God, there are tons of companies that do not get them out by January 31st. Okay. And if you haven't received the W-2 by February 15th, they can use the actual corrected one, the 8552. But, you know, hey, it happens. A lot of times um, you plan on getting it, you plan on having it, and it, you know, you, they, they say, oh, yes, we'll have it for you. We'll have it for you. And you keep going, Where, where's my W-2? You even call HR and go, I haven't received my W-2 yet. And they go, well, it's in the mail. It's been in the mail for a month. Yeah. Probably not. So um, if you have that situation, don't panic. You can always file anyways. So anyways, it's made up of six copies. Now, honestly, most people, you know, don't even realize there are six copies. Okay. That is important to know though, for the test, that there are six copies because we don't actually ever really see six copies because copy A goes to the Social Security Administration. So we don't even know, right. you know. Um, copy one, now they're actually divided up as A, B, and C and copy one, two, uh, A, B, C, and D, and then uh, copy one and two, okay? A goes for, to the Social Security number, to the Social Security Administration, okay? D stays with the employer. Copy one goes for the state, city, or local tax department. So it actually goes to the state department, to the state um, or tax if it's applicable. Now, the employees get this, okay? They actually end up with just three copies of it. That's copy B, copy C, and copy two. Why it's numbered this way, honest to God, I have no idea. Okay, it's kind of like, they started numbering it one way and then just kind of like got drunk or something and had a party. But <laughs> it, it, it's like, honest to God, you know, these people are just like why they did it and then stuck two copy numbers in there. So um, they have for the employer, it should, for the employee, it should have copy B, which is for the federal tax return, copy C for the employee's records and copy two which again, like I said, makes no sense for the state, city, or local tax return. Okay. Those are the ones you send in. All right. So they should have their copy C, which stays with them. Now, half the time they will not have this. Let's be honest. They will walk in and sometimes they just have one copy. Um, that's okay. They only need the one copy. We can make copies of it. It doesn't, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. Um, just having the W-2 is the important thing. Uh, so if we have to make copies of it, we can make copies of Descend. And we do it electronically, so honestly, it doesn't make a difference. We're entering the information anyways. Um, but you do need to know this. Um, if the taxpayer, now by the way, if the taxpayer has copy A, copy one, and copy D, that could be a problem. Okay, because those have had to stay with the employer. And it could just be a screw up. But if they do have those, it could be somebody who is fraudulently trying to provide you with information to get in, to get a tax refund or something like that, who have fraudulently created these to possibly get a tax refund. Okay. So make sure that you do understand that these first two, the uh, first three, the copy A, copy one, and copy D, normally the person will not have. Sometimes they do end up with usually possibly one of them. 
they never have all three of them usually. Okay. If they do, there's, there might be a problem. Um, especially if it's for a, from a large reputable company, if it's for some backwoods company that, you know, whatever, then it's possible because they're usually printed by the company and sent out. All right. But if it's a company that you know is using uh, professional payroll service and that sort of thing, that's where these came from. Okay. And they should typically not have copy A, copy one and copy D. All right. So layout. It's really simple. We've dealt with these for a thousand years. Okay. We know what's supposed to be on them. This is the employer, so the employee's social security number up here. Let me just get to this. So, social security number. Very simple. This should match the number that you have. That is the, probably the most important thing. Right, is making sure, Thank you. Is making sure that number matches. Okay. It's very important that that matches because if it does not match, it's going to get kicked back. All right. If you try to have a social security, uh, a W-2 that you're entering that does not match the social security number of the person whose tax return you are doing, it will get kicked back. Even if it's in the right name, because there's a mistake somewhere. I tens will let them through. I tens will let them through. Yes. But that's an important thing to note is that social security should match. Um, then we go right through here. It is, um, now sometimes understand small companies do buy these as blank forms too. Okay. So sometimes they buy the blank forms and print them up for small companies. So they might not always look like this, but overall, this is the way it should be. Wages and tips, social security wages, Medicare wages. Now, Usually, now this is again the usual part, these are the same number. All right, it's pretty simple. We know that. These are usually the same number. Um, if they're not, then pay attention to it. That's one of the important things. Pay attention if they're not the same number because that means you've got a situation you've got to handle because they're going to have had some form of income that's out of the ordinary. Um, or something in box 12. Something in box 12. There you go. That's something something out of the ordinary. Um, federal income tax withheld. This one you're going to pay attention to. Social Security tax withheld. Medicare tax withheld. Okay. When you're doing this, you're not so so concerned about box, um, about box four and about box six. They are important. The Social Security tax withheld and the Medicare tax withheld, but not really necessarily to you that much. The main one for you is the federal tax withheld. Okay. Now, business EIN number. Guys, where are we going to find the EIN number when we have a problem? EIN maintenance. EIN maintenance. You would not believe how many people in this company do not know how to get to EIN maintenance. And Some look, people may uh, not be able to have access to it. Yeah, actually, that's one of the problems. But we've been we've been pretty good about making sure everybody usually does, and I get all over Mario when people don't. So um, realize that we have thousands of companies' EIN number on file. Okay, so understand that that we should be able to match up most of the time this address with an EIN number in a sense, because that's the company's EIN number. Okay. Very simple. And child care. Child care as well. Yes. Yes. And child care especially. So those are common issues when we get these. They're not that hard. If you take if you stop and just um slow down in a lot in most cases, you'll find an EIN number. EIN maintenance is probably the easiest place to, fi to find the number. We have thousands and thousands in there. Okay. Now, outside of that and down in this area, now to start, this is the person's address. This may or may not match the address you have for them. Okay. Hopefully it does. If it doesn't, that's okay. 
that's not the end of the world. Okay, they may have moved. Now, if every one they have, if they if they're presenting you with like three or four of these, and three of these have different addresses, that's probably an issue. Okay, because something's wrong that the person has moved four times within the same year to four different jobs. Because that's a little weird. But just pay attention to that. Because maybe they're using somebody else's information. Okay, so who knows? That's one of the due diligence issues that is really important to note. Is one of the major things that you're that is a requirement for us to do is due diligence. And it's one of the things that we don't touch on enough because we really need to be able to pay attention to what we're doing to look for problems that come along that most of the time are not really a problem, but for that one time when it is a problem, that we're able to note it and let somebody know. Okay, that's what's really important. All right. Box 12, as she was talking about, is probably the most weird box there is. These are the odd things. Okay. These are things that occur. Okay. Here's box 12, box 13, and box 14. Okay. These are all different plans and different things that they contributed to. Okay or different issues that I should say arise, something that's out of the ordinary. Okay, these are anything that they had as a deduction, um, a different type of employee, a retirement plan, um, a different, and that's box 12 has the codes. The codes in box 12 will tell you what type of deduction it was or what type of contribution it was. These three boxes, basically 12, 13, and 14, are all different types of deductions or things that you will have to deal with in a sense. Usually they're going to go, they will go somewhere basically on the tax return, okay, to adjust it. Pretty much if it's got a box here, if there's something in one of these three boxes, you're going to deal with it in a sense, somewhere in the tax return, okay? Okay, do to do to do. You know how hard that is to turn off when it is on my overall system. So anyway, so it's if it's in one of those boxes, that's a type of payment, contribution, something that you will have to deal with in a sense, okay? So the W-2 is actually laid out pretty well in a sense. There's the information about you, your company, your income, and anything that they took out of it, okay? The very bottom <laughs> section then is the easy one. Same information for the state, okay? Pretty straight up, not very hard, okay? Just information for the state, okay? So we know this, if it's got something here in this area, 12, 13, or 14, just pay attention to it because you know that somewhere in your tax return, you're going to have to compensate for some type of issue, some type of thing that you're going to have to account for, okay? And if it has information down here in the bottom, this is the box 15, 16, 17, 18, these guys, you know there's going to be a state return somewhere, okay? Pretty straight up. All right. The most common type of taxable compensation re reported on a W-2 is normally just good old-fashioned wages, okay? They don't really report anything else on W-2, okay? Let's be honest. 
their part wages. Now, on, in addition, they will report other types of um, compensation that an employee received where they had taxes withheld. Okay, now there aren't too many other types where they withhold taxes. Okay, there are a few, but overall, you know, face it, if it's dividends or something, it's going to be on a different form. It's really not typically necessarily on here. But, sick pay. Sick pay. But like I said, overall, most of the W 2 stuff is straight up, in a sense, wages. All right, now. That's not too complicated. It only becomes complicated when we start adding in things like a 1099, where it's not withheld. It's not on a W-2 because it's not withheld. All right, straight up, wages. This is the transfer, the wages here, transfer to line one here. Okay, pretty simple. Okay, total wages from box one, go to box one on the form. Okay, page two, box one goes to box one. All right, the social security wages, the Medicare wages and social security tips. Now, they should all be the same, okay? However, if they are not, there may be an issue, all right? Now, again, don't worry about this too much because if they are different, you're going to get that within the actual tax return in a different area. But to start, wages and tips, this is the primary one because this is what they get taxed off of. They don't necessarily get taxed off of these. Okay? So, um, Now, the only thing is there is a situation if um, their Social Security here does appear larger than this, there could be a problem. See, like in this case, you'll notice that the Social Security wages are actually higher than the wages and compensation. Now, that would be a problem because rarely are the Social Security wages higher than the wages and tips compensation. Now, this reverse may be possible where the wages and tips is higher than the Social Security wages, but rarely are the Social Security wages higher than the wages and tips. Difficulty of care payment could make it the other way. Right, right. But typically, it's not where the Social Security wages are higher than the actual wages and tips. Okay, so pay attention to that. It's very important when you're looking at these because what may happen is somebody may be fraudulently trying to do something. Okay, now the other side. This is the box two version. Box two are it are the federal taxes withheld. Now again, um, Social Security taxes withheld and Medicare taxes withheld, you're not going to necessarily do that much with. There's not much that we report with it. Those are reported to other things. You're going to be concerned about the federal taxes withheld. Okay. Directly, that goes on to line 16 um, of the tax return. Line 16 gets all the summary of line two, of box two from the W-2. Okay. Very straightforward, not very complicated. Okay, now box four shows the amount of Social Security withheld. Um, now that should be, now again, this is a should be 6.2% of the amount shown in box three. So this should be 6.2% of that and that, okay? So if there are social security tips and social security wages, that should be 6.2% of it, okay? Now the thing that you need to know 
is there is a maximum limit. Okay. This is the only thing you actually need to know for the test because I don't know, I don't think I've ever heard of anybody actually being quizzed on it on the test, but it can come up. There is a maximum limit for Social Security wages withheld. All right. And that maximum limit is 120, well, off of a total wages of $128,400. It is the actual amount of $7,960.80. Now, again, I don't know of anybody who's ever told me that they've had that as a quiz question. Okay. <laughs> but it is a potential one. So just please be aware of that. Okay. So now box six shows the amount of Medicare tax the employer held, and that should be the 1.45% of box five. Okay. Straight up. This is just like um, your normal calculations. It's not too difficult. 1.45% takes it times that should be that amount. Okay. So, now, report codes. Anybody know their codes? Some of them, not very many. All right, let's take a look. D, double D, C, Q. Q, A, B, C, D, A, there you go. So, code A, what is it? What do you think code A is? I don't remember. I don't code. see that one very often. <laughs> no, code A is really weird because it's the Social Security tax the employer was unable to hold, withhold for tips. Um, it's one that we never really see. Code B is the Medicare tax the, unemploy the employer was unable to withhold for tips. So these are very rare, okay? So we rarely see A and B. Code D, we seem to see all the time. Retirement. Yep, retirement. Deferred compensation for contributions to a retirement plan such as a 401k. Now, this is really important because this is contributions that are not part of wages reported in box one. Now, they are included in the Social Security and Medicare wages in box three and five. Okay. So, retirement contribution. Very simple. Okay. And what does that mean they are? Informational. They are pre-tax dollars. Oh, that's it. Yeah, that's what I was going at. These are pre-tax dollars because it's not counted in your income, right? So that's before your taxes. So you're not getting taxed on them. So code Q. Never get it. It's non-taxable combat pay. Okay. So go, go, code Q. I've that's that one a few times. I mean, it's it's very rare. Now, that's oh, actually that's very freedom. cool. It's very cool if you actually got it on there because sometimes we've got it included in taxes and you, they can get a refund for it. It's an important thing. We'll get into later on because that's a, that's a refund from some of, for some of our people. Okay. <laughs> Code V, again, this is income from the excise of a non-statutory stock option. Never happens. Code double D. Okay, that just sounds wrong. Medical. That is the medical. The total amount, the employer and employee contributions of employee-sponsored health insurance. So, straight up, the two we see is D and double D. Okay, that's what we see uh, as our contribution amounts in in box box twelve. Okay, um, health and retirement. Okay, those are the most common ones. So, as long as we know those, especially those two. We're good to go. Okay. Now, there are a couple of other boxes, which are sometimes a pain in the butt because you have to decipher what they mean. Okay. Now, 14 comes with its own set of codes. It is the other box. Now, by other box, um, it includes everything from union dues, state disability income tax, insurance taxes, contributions, military allowances, you name it. All right. So it will have things listed in there um, that 
just appear and don't have another box for at least. And they have the three digit code over here. And you have to decipher what that means. Now, luckily, we do have some tables for deciphering that, so don't don't worry about it. We do have the tables for trying to figure out what the code 14s are, and you can easily look them up. We do have access on the IRS site. You can always look those up. Okay. So don't worry about that too much because we can find out what it means and where it goes then. Um, box 15 through 20, state. This is the exact same thing, guys, as the federal. Okay, this is basically the state's ver version of the Fed. What got withheld, that sort of thing. Okay, very straight up. All right, now let's take a look and answer some questions for the slides. Now, this is going to be hard because, again, it's on this, so I'm going to have to jump back and forth. Well, let's take a few educated guesses. Now, I'm going to read ahead because I can actually see the next slide. So what is the amount of Francis's taxable compensation for federal income tax purposes? So what box are we going to look at? Box one. So we're going to be looking at that. So let's take a look here. So how much is it? Now we look here. What do you think it is? 10,000 bucks. $9,999.74. So, first thing we do, round up. So, it is $10,000. So, what is the amount of Francis's federal tax withheld? Can't see it. $1,014.18. So, ten fourteen. All right, so let's look at it. Ten fourteen. All right. What is the amount of his state income tax withheld? Let's go back to it here. Really small to read, but let's take a look here. Held four ninety six. Four ninety five five hundred? I don't know. Five hundred bucks. Looks like five hundred bucks. Five hundred bucks it is. All right, and what is the amount of local income tax withheld? So let's take a look back here again. Local tax income tax right there. Look 100 there. bucks. Local income tax withheld, 100 bucks. 100 bucks, all right. Good, we don't have to jump back and forth anymore. So yeah. next question for our, our contestants. The next contestant on The Price is Right. Employees should receive. Employees should receive all the following copies of the form W-2, except for B, C, D, two. Which do you think? A poo. Aha! She didn't write it down. Ha ha! I go. Did I? Yeah, maybe I didn't. No, I didn't. Mm. Copy D. There's a vote for B, huh? There's a vote for B. And there's a vote vote for D. No, D. it's not. It's not D. I don't think. D as in dog. D as in dog. Oh, we D. have two votes for D. All right, two votes for D. Drum roll, please. Okay, that was better. <laughs> it is copy D. Oh. Okay, which copy of the Form W-2 should be attached to the taxpayer's federal t income tax return when filing a paper return? Copy A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Oh, no. Copy B. Yeah, it's lucky I know sign language, too. So, anyway, okay, so which one are we talking B as in boy. Um, B as in boy. All right. Ben lost his W-2, so his employer faxed him a copy. Which of the following is true? Ben can use the copy to prepare his return, but he must file an original before he can file. Well, that's probably true. Bill can, pre can prepare and file his return using this copy. Bill must wait until after January 31st to file his copy. Um, 
to file his return with a copy. Oh, that's probably true. You know, Benkin cannot prepare his return or file file prepare or file his return using a copy of his W two. Well, if that was true, we'd yeah. be screwed, wouldn't it? Yeah. Because we have copies all the time. So, what do you think, ladies? Um, he can prepare and file using the copy. I'm for that one. Me too. Ben can prepare and file his return using the copy. Yeah. And the crowd goes wild. What is reported in box 14 of W2? SDI. SDI. That was true. But what is, what is SDI? Something you need to take a shot for. No. State disability insurance. There you go. Miscellaneous information okay, such as. We always had that. All right. So miscellaneous information such as the amount of union. That's it. Okay. And box one shows total to wages, tips, and other compensation. What is not? Which of the following is not included in box one? <laughs> Deferred comp. Yeah. Deferred compensation. Yes. There you go. Very good, ladies. I'm very proud of you. That was perfect. All right. Now, incorrect information. That's what we get all the time, so that's perfect. How <laughs> you handle incorrect information on a tax preparer's W-2 depends on which entry is wrong and why it's wrong. So, the taxpayer's address is incorrect on a W-2. What do you do? You put the right information on the W on the 1040. Okay. And then you tell them to go to personnel and have it fixed. Mm -hmm. Or HR or whoever fixes it. There you go. Now, what if it has an incorrect social security number, incorrect name, or incorrect dollar amount? All at once. All at once, you'd really be out of, you'd be unemployed. I know, it's like, yeah, go. <laughs> you know, it's like, if you have all three wrong, it's a forgery. Yeah. Okay. See you if next you week. Have, if you have one of those three wrong, let me put it that way. They need a corrected W-2. They got to get it. Mm -hmm. You cannot file their tax reform until they receive right. form W-2C. <clears throat> Why is that important? Social Security. Oh. It's, uh -huh. Yeah, it's got to match the one the IRS gets and the Social Security gets. What what, what will happen? They won't get a, get it accredited to them. No, no, hang on. Hang on. What what will actually happen though? This is going to get filed electronically. So what? Ah, uh, thank you, Pam. Kicked out. It will get kicked out. It will get rejected. Oh, yeah, what rejected. will happen is <laughs> I've never had one kicked out because of that. Oh, I've yeah. had lots of them. Well, yeah. if they don't what match. ends up happening is. They I've end sent, up. I've sent people to their employer after the fact. Uh, what will end up happening is, if it doesn't match the database with the Social Security Administration, their database, it will actually reject it, and so as a result, it gets kicked out, and then we get yelled at for the person whose tax re return did not get filed on time, even though it wasn't our fault. Beth, in the case that you were talking about, you corrected the information and just sent them to get it corrected. Right, I never put the incorrect information on the tax return. Right, but if it's incorrect right. and you put the incorrect information in, it will get rejected. That's why right. before, during my interview, I always put the W-2s out and I say, are these your correct Social Security numbers? Mm. I always do that first thing. Right. So never I had that too. So, but the problem is, is technically they're not even supposed to be able to file until they have a corrected W-2. So well, sometimes that's not always. Fast. Oh, I know. So um, sometimes W two may be incorrect because it is fraudulent. So what you want to do is look out for clues that may indicate a W two is fake. Okay, so duplicate or incorrect copies, incomplete or incorrect entries, altered stuff, strike over Russia, um, anything is not computer generated handwritten, typed, or photocopied. There are careless mistakes. Okay, If there are name or social security number er errors, 
incorrect or social security number miss um, and or Medicare withholding. Um, this is an important one. Unusually high federal income tax withheld. Why would they do that? Because yeah, they're trying. They don't want the refund. Yeah. So they crank up the federal income tax withheld so they can get a refund before it, you know. Round numbers. You would not believe how stupid people are. When you're putting in a number and you want to fake it, guess what? You don't put in $100 as $100. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's $119.38. Whatever it may be. But, okay, be honest. You know, it's like, don't, just don't do it. So, Brown numbers, people do not get paid exactly $400, okay? So, it's important. So, due diligence. This is where I was saying that part of your job is really important. This is the due diligence that you do. Um, we are held accountable for this. Now, I realize as a franchisee before, franchisees, are not held as accountable as corporate is. Okay. Corporate is held to a much higher standard because the number of offices we have, there are some things that we actually need to look for that franchisees are not required to look for. We need to report if something is off. There are two different kinds of, of off, okay? By two different kinds of off, if, I mean one that you know is off and one that you suspect is off, okay? There are two different kinds. The you know is off is where the person says something like, uh, Oh, yeah, I'm expecting that W-2, but I don't have it yet, so let's just do it anyway. Now, yeah, that's a bad one, okay? You can't just file the return now because now you're complacent in trying to file a refund, uh, file a return, knowing that they're going to have to file an amendment later on. Yeah, that's fraudulent. Okay? That's fraudulent. You cannot just file it, okay? That's a no-no. So the problem is they say, well, I want my refund on this. Well, a lot of times they're filing it with that one because they've already got the other one and they know they're going to, oh, once that other one gets in. So on this one, they're getting a refund if they just count it. And if they add the other one to it, they know they're going to, oh. I think that's what's happening with RAs as well. Yeah, there's a lot of it. Yeah, they know that that, 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 that that's going to happen. So that's one of the things that we can't do. If they make a comment that you know then to make it a fraudulent issue, you can't do it, okay? And you are required to report it. Now, that's a known fraudulent one. Now there is the what's called a SARS Suspected Activity Report, or Suspicious Activity Report. These are reports when you just, something doesn't smell right, okay? You are still required to report it. Um, now, we aren't held to a standard like the casino. It has to actually report so many. Otherwise, they get in trouble, okay? Because they know there's going to be several of them. Okay. Well, the truth is we should know there's going to be a number of suspected fraudulent attempts through our company. Okay. People do try to fake their taxes. Let's be honest. So we really should be reporting a number of them. We have a tendency not to, but we really should be reporting those suspected fraudulent activities okay so if the person comes in and they report that they are trying to get EITC or something like that and you know that these kids have not lived with this person just based on 
she suddenly has, you know, she's 18, 19, but is reporting that she already has three kids. And you're going, no, maybe not. And they all lived with her. And uh, it's kind of like, come on. You know, there's a point where it's potentially fraudulent. Okay. If this is happening and you suspect that it's not true, you have to kind of act on the, you suspect it's not true. So in other words, you need to ask for documentation or something that you try to verify it. In other words, you have to remind them in a sense, and you need to document this, that um, the IRS, if you are audited, will require you to provide documentation which does prove this to be true. Um, a lot of times they'll suddenly go white and they will be scared because they just realize that it could be jail time if you're lying. And they'll go, you, well, you know, uh, yeah, well, and you know, I think I forgot this document. You know, let me go get, get it quick. And next thing you'll know, you'll never hear from them again because they realize they just got caught. Okay. And they'll be going up the street to another, to the next firm and trying it again, usually. But, you need to realize that in some cases you have to ask questions that will be difficult. Okay. And not only do you have to ask some of these due diligence questions, but then you have to note it in the, in the computer. That's very important. Okay. I can't tell you how important it is that you note what happened. Okay. So if you get a W2 that doesn't look right, or you get information that just doesn't sound right, you need to note it. And that's really important because that's part of your job. Okay. You know, I've heard people say, well, I'm not a fraud investigator. I don't need to do this stuff. Yes, you do. Okay. This is part of your job. So make sure you're doing that. Now, when you're doing this, some made some W-2s have a verification code. Now, it is an alphanumeric code. It's to make sure that it's valid, and it can actually be entered into the tax prep software. Okay, and it's in box nine of the W-2. It's normally set up if somebody has actually had a lot of times um, identity theft. So if they've had identity theft, what will happen is they will actually sometimes have a verification code on their W-2, which prevents it from going in unless it's a, a verified code. Okay. So quiz time. All right. Hands on your buzzers. Okay. Everybody ready? Yep. Marlene received her W-2 on January 23rd, and notice the address shown is her old address. What should Marlene do? Use her old address on her tax return. It's probably, no, probably not a bad idea. Report her current address on her tax return. Correct the W-2 herself. Oh, that's always a good idea, guys. Um, wait until she receives a corrected W-2 to file her return. Who is she going to receive a corrected W-2 form from? So, looks like peace. Yeah, number two. Number two. Number two. Okay. Pedro is a paid preparer. His new client, Amy, gave him a W-2 to look suspicious. Pedro is required to do what? <laughs> Exercise due diligence. You yes. know, Amy, that could almost be really bad. The way you're doing you know, it's like. Oh, my goodness. Rip up the W-2. <laughs> Rip up the W-2. I like that one. <laughs> Report right Amy to the police. Huh? Rip it up right in front of her. Right in front of her. Call the police. Then call the police. And then this the is a, the, and the, This was a fake W-2. She's sitting there going, 
what happened? <laughs> so, exercise due diligence. That's what you need to do. Ask some common sense questions. Which of the following is not an indication that a W-2 may be fraudulent? Okay, it is handwritten. It is computer generated. It includes round numbers. Well, O's are round, zeros are round. So. Entries are lined through and corrected by hand. Oh, that one's a good it's one. It's computer generated. Okay, remember this is the not. So it's yeah. a not. So. so I hate the nots. I hate not. Yeah. So yes, it is computer generated. Okay. Military pay. I don't think they get enough. I'll be honest. I think our military yeah, needs to get paid much better. They and need to get paid much. Either. That's right. I don't think so. I don't think they get paid enough. They do an awful lot. Our, our first responders do not get paid enough for what they do. So military yeah. personnel, personnel receive different types of pay. Some types are taxable and some are not. The following pay is included in taxable income. That's basic pay, special pay, bonuses, and incentive pay. Although all of these types of pay are subject to federal income tax, only some are subject to Social Security and Medicaid, Medicare taxes. Now, allowances. In addition to their pay, military personnel can receive allowances or payments for any expense they incur as a result of their service. Common allowances, including those for living and travel. These expenses are uh, excluded from their taxable income and from Social Security and Medicare taxes, so they don't even show up. So, the allowances are are included in their military pay stub, which is known as a leave and earning statement, but usually do not appear on a military taxpayer's W-2. If sh they are shown on the W-2, they are in box 14 only, so they're in the specialty category. So, okay, combat pay. This one's really important because combat pay does not typically get taxed. So most pay a military taxpayer earns while serving in a combat zone is excluded from their taxable income. The amount of pay excluded is listed separately in box 12 of their W-2 with code Q. It is not part of box one. Generally, if a benefit relating to combat pay is claimed on a tax return, the combat zone should be written on the top of the form 1040 page one, okay? So if a benefit relating to combat pay is claimed on a tax return, the combat zone should be written on the top of page, four, uh, page one. So if it has one, you wanna make sure it's written on there so they know it is it includes combat pay, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, are you ready? Sergeant Reichman is a platoon leader currently serving in the Enduring Freedom Combat Zone. His W-2 is shown. Hmm. He is married, and his wife Sarah lives in the U.S. with their two children, while Connor serves overseas. He served nine months in the combat zone during the tax year. His W-2 and the Form 1040, page 1, are shown. Okay. All right, looking at Connor's W-2, notice how the amounts in box one plus box 12 with code 12 for combat pay equal the amount shown in box three and box five. Okay, so this one and this one equal these amounts. Okay, now this is the important one. This is combat pay. So it doesn't get included in here. Okay, just under the Social Security and Medicare. So, because it is combat pay, it is subject to Social Security and Medicare wages, but it is not included in his wages. Now, box 14 shows where it was in, where he was um, on active duty, Operation Enduring Freedom, and that should actually be included on the page, on the top of the page top of the 1040. Okay. So you normally put, want to put that up here. It would go up here enduring freedom. And the total amount for his income 
is the eight thousand two hundred and thirty dollars. Two hundred and thirty one. Okay, because you want them to let them know that they were in Operation Enduring Freedom. All right, foreign country income. Now, if a military person is serving outside the United States and members of their family may earn non-military income in the foreign country. Now, there are special rules that apply. Okay, it's pretty simple. Richard received the W-2 form. How much of Richard's military pay is taxable? Got an idea? So this is his military form. Okay, he has $14,000 from active duty. So what do we report, report as his taxable income? Six thousand one hundred thirty-six dollars and eighty, 80 cents. cents. You got it. All right, Misty is serving in the military. What type of pay is not subject to the income tax if none of the payments are for service in the combat zone? So base housing. pay, housing allowance, military, military, hostile fire pay. That one's interesting. Reenlistment bonus. So she's not in the military. She's not. Yeah, she's she's serving in the military. Misty is serving in the military. It says. So. But she's not. She's not in um, combat. Uh, for services and wait. Which pay type is not subject to income tax if none of the payments are for service in a combat zone? Hostile fire. It's taking a wild guess. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I think housing. It's the housing. Is it? Yep. Hmm. Yay! It's the housing. <laughs> it's not subject to, to income pay. All right. That is the end of military. So it is now 509. Let's go back to questions. Questions. We have gone over the forms. We've gone over W-2s, the 1040s, the schedules, and types of income. Can you go back to the slide that you chose? Huh? Which one, what, which one, Beth? Oh, I was just wondering if you could go back to the slide that shows the military pay that was that's taxable. That's taxable? Yeah, OK. That's what I was just going to go back here. So, basic pay, special pay, basic pay, special pay, bonuses, and incentive pay. Those are included. Okay. So that's why I was asking that thing here. Ah, they that's right. that's have, you go back. Oh, oh, sorry. Thank you. Okay, and then there are the allowances or payments for which they incur as a result. These allowances include those for living and travel expenses. So it's not uh, uh, taxable. Okay. That's one of their allowances for living and travel expenses. That's one of the only ones. Their living expenses, that's considered a military expense, so. All right, ladies, other questions?